This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. It's decision time for Calvin Johnson. We'll have the official hindsight 20 prediction on what will happen with Megatron. The combine is over, so it's time to talk plenty of draft. We have mock drafts from one website. We have created mock drafts from NFL Draft Geek and the very own Jerry Mallory three-round mock for the Detroit Lions. And yes, we did get a little dose of Bob Quinn, so we'll be talking about that and a whole lot more on the Hindsight 20. This is the Hindsight 20 Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Mallory. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening. As always, I am a small, humble, yet proud part of the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. DetroitSportsPodcast.com is where we can be found. Go to iTunes, subscribe. If you're using Android, go to Pod Bay and subscribe. And when you do that, you'll hear not just myself, but Doc and Jock, Tigers Talk, Fantasy, you name it, it's all there. Detroit Sports Podcast Network, the premier place for all things Detroit sports related in the podcasting universe. The combine's over. You know, we'll talk about that in a second. I'm not the biggest fan. I don't think it's the 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 most common indicator. I really feel like a lot of people are starting to feel that way, especially for certain things like the 40 yard dash. But we will talk about a few notes, things that happen with it. But you know, instead of waiting for this whole Calvin Johnson prediction. We're going to be draft heavy. Let's get right to it. Calvin Johnson and the prediction I have for his fate. Will he remain a lion? Will he retire? Where will he end up? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, free agency is right here. You know, next Monday, it all is going to start going down. Free agents will start meeting with teams. Signings will happen. Uh, Calvin Johnson, we need a decision from him. I do, I do feel as though it's important that the Lions have a basis of knowing uh, what the deal is going to be with Calvin. That's $11 million. That's uh, a very big void to fill. You know, a lot of decisions. And I think this is the week that it happens. We will hear from Calvin. If he's staying, if he's going, something will happen. Something will go down. And, you know, I love the player. You know, he seemed like a really good person as well. But ultimately, you know, we've, we've, we've had great players come. We've had play, great players go. The team is what we cheer for first and foremost. I'm not saying he's holding them up. You know, he's deliberating. The team is saying all the right things, but it is time for something to happen. And I think when it all comes down to it, I believe that Calvin Johnson is coming back. He is playing one more year. That's my prediction. He's had some time to recuperate. Uh, A man that I feel as though loves the game. Some question that. I think he loves the game, but his body is taking a beating. And that takes a toll on you mentally and, yes, of course, physically. He's had some time to heal and lick his wounds, as it were. There's still a little bit of gas left in the tank, a little bit of money to make, a game that he loves. Calvin comes back for one more year. Now, here's where it gets sticky. I don't think he will be a member of the Detroit Lions come next season. Now, if the Lions said, yeah, we'll keep you, we're paying you the 20-whatever on the cap hit, welcome aboard, I think he's down with that. And he says, okay, yeah, I like the team, the players, the fans. I'm willing to play for Detroit. I don't absolutely want to leave. Let's do it. I'm getting a big fat paycheck. I'm down. I don't think that's going to happen, though. And this is where it gets sticky. Bob Quinn looks at Calvin, who says, yeah, I want to come back. Well, he says, yeah, Calvin, we want you back. However, we got to talk money because the cap hit is $24 million. We have to make a decision. I don't feel as though Calvin or Buss Cook is willing to renegotiate, do a new deal, do a Larry Fitzgerald type of uh, you know, ripping up a contract and signing a new, more cap-friendly one for the Lions. I don't think that happens. I don't think he's willing to do that. He He's willing to play for the Lions. And this is all, hey, what, a prediction. I could be right. I could be wrong. I think he's willing to play for the Lions, but he is not willing to play for them at a reduced rate. And so what happens is he's kind of forcing their hand. You either pay me, uh, you know, an absurd amount of money, and I'll return for the team, or... We have to come to a decision because I'm not taking this pay cut. I think Bob Quinn chooses the latter. I think he says, we like Calvin, but that cap hit is too high. Now, remember, you know, $31 million in cap space, even if Calvin returns. So there's a slight chance they say, 
Yeah, we'll swallow it. We still got money to spend. We've got a lot of cap space, and we'll roll with it. But uh, you, you're facing 31 million, or a chance to have 42 million, and the cap with the increases and whatnot. I don't think they're willing to pay him that amount. And so my prediction: I'm not happy about it, and hopefully I'm wrong. Best case scenario: Calvin comes back. There's a new restructured deal that's cap friendly. Uh, but my prediction is: he says he's coming back this week. The Lions confront him about a pay cut. He's not willing to take it, and they release him. Um, Bob Quinn has already shown that he's going to do what's best for this team. And I think he'll look at Calvin Johnson's cap number and say, we like him, good player, monumental. That's not best for the team, and he's released. You know, I'm not going to get into where Calvin's going to end up. You know, I'm not giving you a prediction that far. I do feel as though he'll go to a contender. you got teams like the Panthers. Um, You've got teams like the Cardinals, the Patriots. There's a ton of teams, you know, really talented teams that – could use his services. There's plenty, you know, Kansas City, you know, kind of a low-key spot, really good team. I could see him even doing something like that. I don't think he's too much for the limelight. So, you know, your New Yorks and your Dallases, I don't think he would go in those directions, but you never know. And so uh, something has to give. Like I said, the free agent era is right upon us. We're about a week away from action and things taking place. And um, Calvin's going to let them know something. He's not going to leave them in the lurch. He's not going to leave them hanging He'll let them know before free agency officially kicks off, in my opinion. And what he'll let them know is he's willing to return. Bob Quinn, in turn, says, great, but <laughs> there's some money considerations we got to make, at which point they won't come to an agreement. Calvin Johnson will be cut, and he'll sign off with another team and play another year or two. Hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully, like I said, he comes back on a cap-friendly deal. But that's my official decision. We're going to kick the show off with that. Um, and if that happens... Hey, we'll have tons of talk, tons of uh, content to talk about, reflecting on Calvin. You know, either way, something has to give. I thought by the time I did this show, we would hear something, but we have it. So I'm going to say again, this is the week. This is the week that we hear something, and it will be plenty to talk about whether Calvin is staying, going, is released, contract, whatever happens. We'll be discussing something I'm going to say next week for sure. My prediction is, though, ultimately, they won't come to an agreement on the finances. Buzz Cook, Calvin Johnson say, hey, We're not taking a pay cut. We've done so much for this team. This isn't a winning organization. We want to help, but we're not taking a pay cut. And uh, Bob Quinn says, oh, well, we're going to have to move on. We love you, Megatron, but we are no longer going to be keeping you around. Speaking of Bob Quinn, he addressed the, uh, the media last week during the combine, and he reiterated some of the same things, you know. Uh, I really like what he had to say in terms of depth. You know, hey, this is a 7-9 team. It's a reason why. And you look at uh, the depth issue and what happened between an 11-5 and five team and a 7-9 and nine team, you lose suit. So if you had that depth, depth as in maybe drafting Aaron Donald, not even Aaron Donald. We can go on and on about that, but just having a contingency plan behind those guys, you're not as in bad of shape. Now, I think they did try to address outside linebacker with Kyle Van Noy. You know, you would have liked to uh, see him and Levy out there together wreaking havoc. Uh, Levy goes down, Van Noy, not even close to being ready, although he was your second-round pick just a couple of years ago. And so depth at that linebacker spot just was not there. And so I think Bob Quinn, he keeps saying it, there's a theme, depth, depth, depth. I think depth will be addressed. Now, what are some positions that can use depth? Quarterback is one. He said that was one of the strongest units on this team. That's because it's Matt Stafford, and and, uh, it seems as though he feels like I do. Stafford is a talented player. But if Stafford goes down, what's next? Well, there's nothing there. And so with that being said, depth for the quarterback position will have to be addressed by means of the draft and free agency, in my opinion. You look at a guy like Drew Stanton. I think he'd be really good as a backup. And then I'd be willing to spend one of my compensatory or even my regular fifth-round pick to bring in a quarterback. Will Cardo Jones fall that far? I like Cardo Jones, man. I really feel like someone can take a hold of him mold him for two seasons or more, and he'll be a valuable asset. Either you can trade away or he can slide into a starting role on the team. And, uh, you know, will he will he last there? I don't know. We don't have a third-round pick. I wouldn't spend one on him anyway. Well, compensatory, we'll probably get a third-rounder for Sue, but we don't have our traditional third-round pick, <coughs> Gabe Wright. You know, we'll talk about that on another show, <coughs> Gabe Wright. Um, but fourth round, maybe, maybe just maybe. Fifth round, I'm really comfortable targeting a quarterback there. So that's one position where depth has to be addressed. One of the things he also mentioned was the linebacker spot. 
and how the nickel is used so much in today's NFL, why Quandry Diggs will play a key role in this team next year. He'll be on the field a lot more than a traditional linebacker. So that need for that middle linebacker is not as strong as it used to be because he's on the field for a down or two in a series. Uh, not always out there, you know, three down linebackers are a premium, which Levy is, which Tulloch wasn't. So, you know, start thinking, well, Reggie Ragland, you know, is he one of those guys that uh, in that third down situation when you drop to the nickel cornerback, you're comfortable with him in space? We've been talking about Reggie Ragland a lot. I like him. I think he could be a, a valuable piece to this team. But, you know, if they're moving from that traditional three down, three linebacker sets, which most teams are, then you start looking at some of your speedier guys, your Darren Lees. And um, to hear Whitehead, I think, becomes valuable at that point because he has some athleticism. It all depends on what the team wants to do. But that was an interesting nugget. Uh, back to the depth situation, I think uh, quarterback, like I said, could use some running back as well as that defensive line. He said the defensive line looks good. He mentioned that as one of the units that had you know good talent and strength. But I think he could use some depth as well. He also mentioned tight end, which is interesting. Now, Brandon Pettigrew, uh, had he not torn his ACL, I think he would already be dismissed from the Lions. Because of the injury, you know, cutting a guy, uh, it gets tricky. You don't save as much money. But I think the team is looking at Eric Ebron, and he also mentioned him, saying he made a big leap from year one to year two. Year three should be pivotal, but you still need that second guy. You still need that blocker. You still need the guy that can catch. And um, the Brandon Pettigrew role is very important on this team. Uh, Even with Brandon Pettigrew being down, he tore that ACL, which I kind of forgot about. But yeah, he tore the ACL. And so we have to wait and see what the team is going to do, how they're going to address that, because that is still, although we spent a 10th pick on a tight end, it's still a position of need, which kind of drives me crazy. But it is what it is. But it was interesting to hear uh, Bob Quinn speak on some things. You keep hearing him say depth. I'm liking that. He's trying to build a team that, because of injuries or ineffective play, the next man up can come in and produce at a high level. Bob Quinn wasn't the only front office guy to speak to the media in the last week or so. President Rod Wood also addressed the media. He did uh, some interviews on DetroitLions.com, went on 105.1, spoke to the media a couple of times in the last few weeks, which is interesting. I like uh, the things that he's been saying. First off, uh, when the, when he first got the gig, you know, everyone was wondering and worrying, you know, one of the four guys doesn't have the football experience. They wasted no time bringing in a Corsi. They wasted no time relying and bringing in football knowledgeable guys. And so he's a president in the sense of the other things outside of the game. And everything supposedly is on the table, which I like. So um, we're going to step away from football, like player acquisitions for a second. The Detroit Lions as a team. Some things that have been mentioned, some things I would like to see. And Rod Wood said all these things are options and on the table. The first is the uniforms. Let's talk about the Detroit Lions uniforms for a second. Now, of the four major sports, I would say the Lions are dead last. If I'm ranking uh, each team, now the Tigers and the Red Wings, it's close. It's really hard to say which one. I'm going to give the slight edge to the Detroit Tigers. Detroit Tigers is number one in terms of uniform. The logo is classic. It's timeless. The old English D, you can't go wrong with it. Like I said, though, the Red Wings is really good, too. And so they are number two. And, you know, that classic wheel, the wheel and wing, the red, you, you know, you just love it. When you see it, it's classic. You hope those two teams really never change up. And if they do, minor tweaks maybe, but you want them to stay the same. The Pistons, they're third. Theirs is okay. I mean, it, it's not great, but it's not horrible either supposedly they're going to be changing their logo in a couple of years. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what they might do. Uh, the rumor is they may do, uh, they may be doing uh, kind of a, a nod to the bad boys days with the piston logo and whatnot. So it will be a, a transformation, but nothing too heavy. And like I said, last place to me is the lions. I don't like the, the little squiggly lettering. They call it motor city, whatever that is. I don't like it. Um, and you know, the colors, obviously Honolulu blue and silver is nice, you know, bubbles, the lion on the, on the side, people used to always say how it looked weak and it looked, um, uh, what, what would people say? It looks weak and it looks lame. And, and so they added a little outline to them. They gave them some teeth, but ultimately I'm not crazy about it. I don't know what exactly they're going to do as far as change. I've heard they will be introducing some alternates this year, perhaps bringing in some black, which is cool, but ultimately, the uniform, it needs some work. 
definitely starting with the lettering. I like more traditional lettering, and these are the these are the outside things. This is where Rod Wood is going to kind of flex his muscle. Things outside of the football acquisition. Uh, we care about football acquisition the most. We care about wins. When talking about these uniform changes with a friend of mine a couple of days ago, he said, "Hey, uniform changes isn't going to make them any better." Yes, we get that, but it's still part of the package, although not as important as player acquisitions and wins. We get it, but it's still fun to talk about. Now, the second one, our cheerleaders. He said that is on the table. Would love to see that just because, man, you know, the fact that we haven't had any, and it was a big thing about the Fords. You remember the Detroit Pride? It was like the unofficial, unsanctioned Detroit Lions cheerleaders. You see them at the tailgates quite a bit. I think they're still around. I'm not sure. It would be cool. I just think seeing cheerleaders for the Detroit Lions, to me, just means we have changes. We have a different owner. We have another president. It's it's more symbolic. You know, actually seeing the cheerleaders, take them or leave them, really, but seeing them on the field, in my opinion, just signifies that, yes, this is not the same old regime. Martha Ford uh, is different. Rod Wood is different. Things that would never happen before coming into play. And so from that standpoint, I say, yeah, it would be kind of cool if they brought in cheerleaders from that standpoint. Now, this one is far-fetched. It won't happen, and it's not always feasible when it's late, but it would be cool. Uh, Martha Ford uh, mentioned this one, the Lions playing outside. She said she would like to see that. That would be cool. Now, when it's December and you're in Michigan and it's seven below, yeah, Ford Field is nice. Indoors is nice, Um, and, you know, Ford Field is so beautifully made and constructed even though it's, what, 20-something years old now, about, no, no, not 20-something years, over 10 years old, I should say now, about, what, 13 or so, 13, 14 years old, still one of the best in the business, and it's not going anywhere. Now, when they first were building it, it were rumors that they were going to do a retractable roof. I don't think it's feasible for that to happen now, but, hey, Martha Ford mentioned it, and I'll say it as well. It would be cool on a nice, you know, not too cold day, maybe in October or so. It's about 40 45 degrees and the wind is blowing the leaves and you got the lions playing outside. I think that would be cool. A retractable a roof situation to me, that would be the best case scenario. Not too cold when December hits and it's all freezing. You close that roof up and you still can play some football. The weather does not play that big a role, but on a nice day, you know, when the season first begins in September, it's still nice outside. I think it would be neat to see our boys playing outside. Really good for the acoustics as well. Supposedly the dome's holding the noise better, but I like the acoustics on that outside. When you got 60,000 fans and it's outside, it's a cool thing to behold. The Lions never experienced, but you know, we see it whether we go to a Lions game on the road, whether it's Michigan or Michigan State. Now, the last thing that I'm hoping is going to change with President Wood at the toll is media access. Now, I've been a part of the outskirts of media for quite some time now, dealing with the Detroit Lions, um, the Pride of Detroit, been proudly with them now for about five years, and now the Detroit Sports Podcast. And Detroit Lions, their media relations, and just as a whole has looked at blogs and podcasts as the fringes, and not really allowing access, whether it be interviews, press passes, et cetera, et cetera. I'm hoping that changes under Rod Wood. I think it will. Now, he seems to be more proactive. I think he's a man that won't be so stuck in his old ways. You know, these guys aren't real. They don't have print. You know, if it's not newspaper print, if it's not, you know, one of the big websites, it's not credible. Well, hopefully... He has the mindset to say these guys are progressive. The younger fans and a good chunk of knowledgeable fans go to your Pride of Detroit, go to your Detroit Sports Podcast to get their fix in addition to some of the media outlets. A lot of these media outlets, you know, bounce back and forth with us, communicate with us. They realize it, but the Lions themselves, they haven't. I'm hoping Rod Wood can be that change, someone that says, no, these guys are credible. These guys are good. Let's listen to see what they have to say. And we take it from there. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's all draft, baby. I've got a mock draft for one of my favorite websites. I did one of those creative mock drafts from NFL Draft Geek. And then the official Jerry Mallory Hindsight 20 mock draft. So stay right here on the Hindsight 20. Jerry Mallory here for the Hindsight 20. Your ad can be placed right here. It's simple. Send us an email, hindsight20podcast at gmail.com. Back is back. 
cause I'm mass destruction. All right, we are back on the Hindsight 20. It's time for draft. Goodness, like I said, we've got a mock draft from a site that I really like. We did Walter Football last time. Now we're going to do NFL Draft Geek. I have one of the created mock drafts, which is a feature on NFL Draft Geek. I have my own official three-round mock. It's plenty of draft goodness to talk about. Let's discuss the combine for just a second. Um, I will say this. You know, the 40 to me isn't that big of a deal. Sometimes guys really pop out, though. You know, Aaron Donald, when he ran away like a four, six, eight, the guy's almost 300 pounds. That is crazy. Well, Emmanuel Ogba from OK State did the same thing today. He ran, what was it, a four, six, nine. Okay, this is a big man. It was unofficial. I don't know what it ended up being ultimately, but, you know, this is really fast. Okay, guys, this is extremely fast for a guy that big. Kind of reminds you of Ziggy Ansah that ran in like the four sixes as well, I want to say. You know, just seeing those big guys get up and down the field that fast is impressive. Now, uh, the 40 is not the biggest indicator. To me, I, I really prefer the cone and the shuttle drills. The cone and the shuttle, those to me kind of translate because how quick are you? How quick can you react? How quick can you change pace? How quick can you adapt when that running back cuts back, when that quarterback tries to, you know, deke you and juke you? Uh, That's something where Ziggy Ansai really stood out as well. Now, this year, Joey Bosa, you know, he didn't look that great in the 40, straight line. Well, he won't be running 40 40 yards in a straight line. However, when you talk about those cones and those shuttles, Joey Bosa really showed out. And while people will say that he didn't have a good combine because he didn't jump that high or he didn't run the 40, look at the cone, look at the shuttle, and then tell me differently. You know, he really looked good from those things, and I think that translates to the NFL more than anything else. Now, who I really like, and I'm not just talking about the uh, the measurables, just looking at those individual drills, position drills, Andrew Billings looked good, man. He looked fluid. He had power. This guy looked nasty. I've been seeing him drop like the second round. There's so many defensive tackles, somebody will drop, okay? Will it be him? I'm not sure, but just from looking at the individual drills, I really, really like what I saw. Andrew Billings, defensive tackle from Baylor, someone that the Lions may have on their radar. And, yes, someone will drop. I don't think it will be him. I can see a Jerron Reed falling before him. Um It, it, it really depends, but I do, I will say this, he looked fluid. Uh, the individual drills, he had power, he had speed, he looked nasty. He looked like a guy where if at the 16 pick the Lions were picking him, I'd feel very comfortable and say, you know what, hey, I'm no expert. I'm not talking about the measurables, just looking at how fluid he looked both on tape and during the combine drills, he may be a special player at the next level. Let's get into some of the mock draft madness Next week, next show, we'll be talking a lot about free agent, some targets, because free agency is right around the corner. But this week, with the combine in mind, we've got some mock draft madness to get into. So let's start off with NFLDraftGeek.com and their official mock draft. This is Nolan Vassan's deal, his website. He does a great job. He joined us on the show last week. Now, remember, the Lions don't have a traditional third-round pick because of (coughs) Gabe Wright. Don't remind me. But uh, they do have one as terms of a compensatory, more than likely. Well, not even more than likely. It will happen because of Indomitian Sue. But as far as NFL Draft Geek, they just have the, um, they don't have the compensatory picks on there. They do have the first two rounds, though. So they don't have a traditional third round pick for the Lions. So for the first round, they've got Reggie Ragland. Like I said, I'd be more than happy and comfortable if this was the pick. Someone right in the middle, you lose Tullock, you insert Reggie, uh, Reggie Ragland. Now, he covers the field pretty good. I think if you're going to uh, just have two linebackers, I'd be comfortable with him and Levy in a nickelback on third down situations. And uh, we already know what he can do first and second down. He plays the run. He's tenacious. He has the attitude and the mindset of a leader. He has no, no known character issues. The Lions are looking for those type of players. And so Reggie Ragland, be more than comfortable if this was the pick there out of Alabama. C.J. Mosley just got drafted by Baltimore a couple years ago. He was the man in the middle at Alabama. 
They run complex defenses. You know, it's Nick Saban. Let's not act like we don't know what Nick Saban is all about. Very good. Complex defenses. If you can grasp their uh, defensive scheme, you have a good shot at going to the next level and having pretty good comprehension for whatever NFL scheme will be thrown your way. Now, in the second round, I would love if this guy fell to us. Taylor Decker, Ohio State, big man, six foot seven. We need help at the offensive tackle position. Now, uh, Bob Quinn kind of negated Jerry Mallory. I made that prediction that maybe just maybe Riley Reef would be cut. Bob Quinn, hey, maybe you're listening to this show because he made a point of saying, no, Riley Reef is coming back. And that's fine. The issue is he only has one year left on the contract. Is he worth an extension? And will he play left or right? Then you have Michael Ola. Do you trust him? Are you going to just say, hey, Reef at left, Ola at right, we're all good? No. You need depth. I think no matter what happens, you're going to draft a guy at some point and you're going to sign a veteran free agent. Taylor Decker has a mean streak to him. He's big. He uses that size. He uses that power. And I think someone uh, once said, you know, some of your best left tackles would make superb right tackles at the next level. Is that him? I'm not sure. I think he actually could play left tackle, though, uh, at the next level. Interesting pick. Will he fall that far? I don't know. You know, after Laramie Tunsil and Ronnie Stanley, Conklin, Decker, um, it's not the strongest position this year in terms of a uh, left tackle, offensive tackle in general. You know, years past, you'd say, hey, there's like five, maybe even six surefire left tackle candidates. This year, it's like two, two and a half, you know, are going in the first round. Tunsil, no question. Stanley, no question. Conklin, that's the half. I'm like 90% sure he goes in the first round. Decker, yeah, we're starting to get shaky, and so you go from there. Uh, Cody White here, he's projected to be maybe a guard the next level. It's not an extremely strong position at the first few rounds, and so from that standpoint, I can see someone reaching a little bit earlier and picking up Decker, but if he falls to us in the second round, I'd be more than pleased with the Lions at the end of the first and second round, walking away with Reggie Raglan and Taylor Decker. Now, next up, we're going to do something a little bit different. Now, this was fun. You can do this on FanSpeak. You can do this on NFL Draft Geek. Uh, Draft Geek. You create your own draft. These always end up being just way better than I would ever imagine. Someone always drops first, second, and third round like clockwork, so I love it. So I went ahead and did the NFLDraftGeek.com's draft machine, draft maker. You draft a player. Uh, and then they draft the rest of them for you. You keep going round after round. You pick your team. You pick your rounds. It's really, really fun. So I went ahead and went with uh, NFL Draft Geeks database, and this is who I ended up with. And so in the first round, the 16th overall pick, the Detroit Lions select Jalen Ramsey. Now, if he falls to number 16, this is a guy that can play corner or safety. You would be jumping for joy because he's a top five talent. Uh, this guy out of Florida State, I don't think he lasts past number five. But, hey, the draft machine spoke, and the Lions ended up with a guy that's very versatile. He can line up as a cornerback next to Darius Slay doing his thing. We may also need some help at safety, depending on what happens with uh, Issa abdul Kadus. So I'd be more than happy if this guy landed to us. Now, check out this second round, guys. This is not going to happen. If it does, you just hit it out the ballpark, guys. First round was Jalen Ramsey. Second round. The Detroit Lions select Sheldon Rankins, okay, from Louisville. I like these draft machines. They, I, I think every now and then they insert a player that's, or two or three, that's not really supposed to go in those slots. All of that does happen in real life, and it just seems like you can get some serious talent when you play with these draft machines. And so Sheldon Rankins falling all the way to the second round. Yes, we do a backflip. Yes, we jump for joy. no. He won't be there for the Lions picking the second round. But it's fun to play this game, is it not? Now, third round, you know, with the compensatory, I basically just went based off of uh, after the third round was over, who was left. Scooby Wright from Arizona, outside linebacker, one of those guys that, you know, Bob Quinn mentioned, hey, you need two linebackers that can cover some space, and you have your nickel back on third down. So everything worked out from that standpoint. Again, I don't think Mr. Scooby is going to be there in the third round, especially for our compensatory pick, but the draft machine said he was available, and so we roll with it. Now, here is my mock draft. This is the one. This is the one you all have been waiting for. Now, to give myself a little bit of credit, I've, I've been pretty good. I would say if you can name one or two players 
uh, from each draft that will go to your team, you've done pretty good because there's so many scenarios and ways and things, so many options. So just to toot my horn, a few years ago, Ryan Broyles was someone I mentioned the Lions would be looking at, potentially interested in. Sure enough, he got drafted by the Detroit Lions. Same with Kellen Moore. Last year, I mocked, yes, Big Lake and Thomason going to Detroit. Now, I thought they would uh, end up getting him in the second round, perhaps trading up, but they went ahead and drafted him in the first round. So I've been able to hit a time or two, a few players, uh, mock to go to the Lions, and this is not my official or final. No, it is my official mock draft. This is not my final mock draft, but here we go nonetheless. I'll start from three and work my way up to one to build the suspense. It's always fun to do it that way, right? So with our third round compensatory pick, the Detroit Lions select offensive tackle out of Western Michigan, Willie Beavers. Now, many are saying he might just be a guard. I think he could be a right tackle at the next level. He has size and athleticism, but he has to improve. Now, he's not the strongest. He's going to have to get bigger. He's going to have to get tougher. I think from a technical standpoint, he will be just fine as a right tackle. Now, right tackles are usually stronger in maulers. So you draft this guy and you sit there and you put him in a weight room. And he's not, as I'm saying this, I'm like, ugh, because you heard a lot of these things about Travis Swanson, right? I don't think the same situation will be said, though, for Willie Beavers. He has the tools necessary to uh, to get bigger, the frame. And uh, some scouts are saying uh, he will improve in those areas. And so this is a guy that you bring in. You don't, you're not expecting him to start day one. You got Ola. You got Reef. You just signed a guy. But Beavers is right there. He gives you that depth. He's a local guy playing at Western Michigan. Lots of talent. Lots of uh, upside. And in a year or two, when it's time to make some decisions and say, hey, we can't keep Reef or Ola or whatever, I think Beavers will be ready to step right in. Now, in round two, this is going to get a little bit interesting. I've got Sua Cravens from USC going to the Detroit Lions. Now, hear me out. This is a guy that can play safety or a linebacker, kind of in the mode of what Arizona has done with Dion Buchanan, a guy that could play both. And really, it was a safety. They dropped him down to linebacker. And so, yes, he could be on the field for all three downs because coverage-wise, he was a safety. I think Cravens can do just that. And he kind of fits the mold exactly in what uh, Bob Quinn was saying, saying how, well, the linebacker spot, you really don't use it as much and this and that. Well, if you got a linebacker that can also play safety, then you've kind of hit the jackpot. In addition to the fact that he can just, yes, play and start at safety next to Glover Quinn. He could be your strong safety. Sue Cravens, tons of talent, and I'm envisioning a scenario where on first down and second down, you've got Sue Cravens playing safety in the box occasionally, kind of getting his James ahead of Bow on. On third down, he drops, he drops into the slot. He can be that linebacker that can play in coverage. And so you can have Cravens out there along with like Levy, and you can still have uh, your guy, Quandry Diggs, being that nickel corner. But you've got two guys that are really good, can cover a lot of field in terms of your two quote unquote linebackers, Cravens, DeAndre Levy, roaming the field on third downs. You still got your nickel corner. And then East Abdul Caduce can be your other safety next to Glover Quinn. I think there's a lot of flexibility you have. When you have a guy like Cravens, even if you want to have Levy, another traditional linebacker, and drop Cravens down to be the outside linebacker on third downs instead of the nickel being Quandry Diggs, and you got Issa Kabdu. I could just see so many scenarios where you can get creative. A guy that can play linebacker strong enough to play a run and stout, but is also a safety, and supposedly the Lions view him more as a safety. I think the creativity that you have with a guy like that filling kind of two needs in some ways, would be really good. Deion Buchanan there in Arizona is really breaking the mold. What he's doing, revolutionizing and uh, just creating a whole new skill set, very productive there in Arizona. We can get our version of that in the second round. Now, in the first round with the 16th pick, Detroit Lions select out of Louisville, the big man, Big Shelly, Sheldon Rankins. Listen, I think there's t uh, a ton of defensive tackles, so much so where the Lions could potentially wait to the second round, maybe even the third round and get a guy like Austin Johnson. In that second round, I'm telling you guys like Jerron Reed will be there. I've seen mock drafts with my boy Andrew Billings falling all the way to the second round. That's all fine and dandy, but Sheldon Rankin's sitting there. Although Bob Quinn said defensive line is kind of solid, 
and we've got depth. Although we could probably get a guy in the second round still, Sheldon Rankin sitting there would be too hard to pass up, and the Lions pounce on it, pick him up, and he is the newest member of the Detroit Lions. So Jerry Mallory's first official mock draft has Sheldon Rankin's going in round one, round two. We've got Sue Cravens in round three, the compensatory pick, the pick we get for losing Sue. We've got Willie Beavers from Western Michigan. Guys, the next show, we can have decisions on Calvin Johnson. I think it's coming up. But whether we do or don't, we're going to be draft, uh, not draft free, but draft light because free agency will be just around the corner. I will give you the definitive guide for the Detroit Lions, who they will be targeting, how much they're going to cost, some pretty bold predictions, and a few other surprises. This has been fun, guys. Like I said, draft heavy this week with the Combine. Mixing in a little bit of uh, Bob Quinn, a little bit of Calvin Johnson. We even squeezed in some Lions playing outdoors, talk, uniforms, and cheerleaders. It's how we do it on the High Insight 20. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening. We'll be back, as always, next Monday. Like I said, draft light, free agency heavy. And until then, this has been Jerry Mallory. I'll see you next week.